we're going to kick off. I am delighted to be able to introduce Amy Clark, who's a co-founder of Tribe Impact Capital. Um, uh, on most good days when the conduit is open, I have the enormous pleasure of bumping into her on the second floor of the conduit where Tribe have their offices. Um, so it is very bizarre, Amy, to be staring at you on a Zoom screen when we would otherwise be bumping into each other uh, uh, bleary-eyed looking for coffee on the second floor. Well, as Vera Lynn said, Paul, we'll meet again. <laughs> there's, there's no question about that when we can get, our, get out of our stir-crazy claustrophobia that we're all locked down in right now. But on to happier subjects. Um, as you know, um, Build Back Better is designed to interrogate um, how we return from the crisis of the pandemic to a, a just, a more just, a more sustainable society that's better both for people and for the planet. Um, and in some ways, you have really been at the vanguard of the impact investing movement, um, have been working on this prior to the pandemic. And it is our sincere hope that capital begins to be allocated more in the fashion that you have been allocating it prior to the pandemic when we emerge from it. So I guess my first question to you is to kind of nail this question of performance. Um, what do we know about how ESG funds have performed? And then a, a narrower question about how true impact funds have performed through this crisis. And what might that tell us uh, about what to expect when we begin to return to a new normal? Um, great question, Paul. There has been so much information, I think, recently being made available to the broad public. The FT Moral Money, for example, have been doing a sterling job in highlighting lots of different forms of statistics relating to not just the inflows of capital into specifically ESG investing, um, but also uh, the baked in resilience that now seems to be coming through in terms of performance and ESG outperformance in this current crisis. Um, I'll give you a couple of uh, statistics just to set things in, in context. Um, ETFGI, which is a London-based consultancy that focuses uh, really on reviewing and researching ESG ETFs, so the passive vehicles that are in the market, um, have looked at the inflows into ESG ETFs between January and February this year and January and February last year, so 2019. And for January and February 2019, the inflows into ESG ETFs um, were $2.4 billion. I think it was $2.4 billion. Um, this year, for the same period, it's $14.3 billion. Now, that's an absolutely extraordinary increase in the eye of the storm. So we can see straight away that the market's starting to view ESG as a potential safe harbor in times of crisis. And as you and I know, Paul, and no doubt the people on this call know, it's much more than a safe harbor in a time of crisis. Um, so we've seen inflows increasing massively, which is very, very reassuring. We all know the issues around ESG, and we can come on to that a, a little bit later in terms of what ESG is and, and what it's not. Um, BlackRock, um, some people may have seen the BlackRock's um, uh, investing institute statistics that came out in the FT as well, where um, I can't show it to you annoyingly, um, but I can certainly make it available afterwards. A phenomenal chart, again, looking at this quarter and looking at traditional investment versus um, ESG investment. And again, the baked in resilience there um, and the outperformance over this quarter of ESG strategies in the marketplace as well. And now that's coming from BlackRock. Um, you know, there's a lot of information in the marketplace at the moment that is, is certainly heralding that the system at large is beginning to understand the value um, that even a, in many ways a simple ESG lens can bring to your investing. Now, at the moment, we don't yet have the data points for what we would term sustainable and impact investing. Um, that will hopefully come in time. Uh, but, you know, if one was to extrapolate out, bearing in mind ESG is a measure as to of, of how well run a company is with regards to the risk it faces from environment, from social, from governance related um, uh, risks, one 
would assume a well-deployed sustainable investing strategy and or impact investing strategy, strategy should do the same, um, potentially if not more as well. But those data points aren't yet there, um, Paul. And, and do we have any data? I mean, obviously the inflows are, and that data is, is kind of a remarkable sort of market indicator. Do we have any data just on performance or at least how much uh, these funds have um, uh, comparatively not underperformed versus uh, funds which have really been very hard hit by, by the pandemic? Yes, so HSBC actually interestingly released a research note. Um, they looked at 613 publicly listed shares uh, that had a $500 million plus market cap and at least 10% of revenues in climate solutions, so clean and affordable energy. Um, they then looked at the further 140 uh, publicly listed shares that had high ESG scores and they looked at those um, from the 10th of December to the 23rd of March. So again, sort of eye of the, uh, eye of the storm. Um, and what they found that the um, overall, all of the stocks um, uh, outperformed by 3%. Um, but the climate stocks, uh, the 613 shares, outperformed by 7.6% um, compared to the benchmark um, that they use. So we're starting to see again, you know, actually looking specifically at, at uh, not necessarily through the lens of the, the, each individual fund, but looking at the market as a whole, we're starting to see that. Um, I mean, we've certainly seen with the funds that we use, we've seen some funds who have, again, ridden um, the downturn far uh, more resiliently um, than others in the marketplace as well. And as I said to you, Paul, just before this call, we'll be releasing, hopefully next week, we don't normally do this um, because we're long-term investors, as you know, and we don't like quarterly data points. Um, but we think that now, this quarter, uh, it's a very, very valid and very vital data point to get out to the marketplace. So we'll be sharing our quarterly performance, hopefully next week, um, which uh, will be another data point in the market and hopefully a very um, reassuring one. So, so let me now drill down. Before we started, we were talking about ESG as a kind of way of thinking about risk versus true focus dedicated impact investing uh, to the extent that that's a distinction and what we may begin to um, sort of see in the distinction between those two categories. So firstly, would you just for those people who don't follow this, these arcane definitional distinctions, let us know uh, that distinction and then let's talk a little bit about what we might see in, in, in this regard. Mm. So, um to, to, without wanting to be too reductive and, and oversimplify it, um, ESG really is, is looking at how well run the company is. Um, so you're looking at management policies and processes across the entire business to get a handle on how well they're managing the environmental, the social and the governance issues related to their business. So for example, um, how well they're managing waste um, and you know, pollution, how well they're um, managing the supply chain, how, or how well they're managing the ratios and the differentials between top floor to shop floor pay um, as well. So it's really looking at the management culture and the management processes within a business. Ergo, how well run is the business? Impact investing is really taking that and saying, well, that's, that's one side of the business. The other side of the business is fundamentally what it does. What's the core product and the service solution that it has in the marketplace? And how much value does that add to society, given what we know the issues that society faces now are as well? And that's where things like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals play a huge role in helping us understand what products and services does society and the planet really, really need to create these beautiful safe spaces where everyone and everything can thrive? So there's a real difference um, between the two, and, and one is a subset of, of the other. You know, ESG is not an impact investing strategy, but it forms part of an impact investing strategy. So let me drill down a little bit just on kind of because you know, no two impact investments are equal and you know there's there's a massive differential between you know what's happening in uh distributed off-grid solar and my molecular biology labs and 
Oxford, um, uh, both of which could be true impact investments. Um, and so it, let, let me try a very, very crude high level hypothesis, which is there are going to be certain impact investments that um, are going to be wildly benefited by this crisis and, and certain, particularly in the health space, in the pharmaceutical space, in the vaccine space, in sort of um, anything to do with sort of um, genomics and medical research in principle should be really good for humanity. And if you pick the right investments should also be terrifically, you know, produce terrifically good returns. Um, now let's turn to kind of to to the kind of classic climate investments, wind, solar, um, the kind of core areas that we have to roll out faster than ever if we are to avoid going above one and a half, let alone two degrees. How do you think those investments are going to fare in a world where government support and investment for this is quite likely to dramatically drop because government's balance sheets are just under siege. Um, but it will be more important than ever to try and roll out this infrastructure. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one because there are so many issues that we face as a global community. And it's not just the role of government to address these issues the same way it's not just the role of business to address these issues. We need a community of effort and a community of capital and regulation and shifts in consumer behavior to come together to tackle all of these. I think what's really interesting um, with the current crisis, um, and I don't know whether you saw the Royal Society um, study that's come out, which uh, builds on something that we saw in The Guardian a couple of weeks, it's a couple of weeks ago now, um, linking the COVID pandemic to our mass incursion into ecologically sensitive areas. So you, you can't really, unpack the two um, and then this massive call on top of that for any government bailout packages to be cognizant of the bigger issues that lead to these crises and therefore linking that level of um, potential financial support and fiscal stimulus to measures that really give us an idea as to whether or not these businesses are changing. Um, there's, there, there is concern in the marketplace that um, the current crisis that we're in could deflect capital away from these other crises that are still looming. The climate crisis hasn't gone away. The biodiversity crisis hasn't gone away. COVID has shown us that the inequality crisis is still there front and center. Um, I think the role of investment has always been to have a multifaceted approach to understanding what the true level of risk is within any investment. So whilst we might all get very excited about the opportunities to go in healthcare, we're also looking short, medium and long term for where the next investment opportunities are, but also where the real critical risks are. So I probably feel a little bit less concerned that we're going to see capital from the investment community deflect away from some of the other priorities, for example, like clean and affordable energy. I, I have... Um, I think less concern there because the the financial still you know the financial imperative to invest there still makes makes sense. My concern is whether or not we get the right regulatory environment coming alongside to really support uh, a shift in the system. And the EU, as we know, have been doing phenomenal work there on taxonomy as well as you know potentially you know uh, looking at the details of the Green New Deal. It's how do, we, how do we as a community let the government know that there is capital available to sit alongside public capital to create the shifts short, medium and long term so that they understand that whilst they may choose to right here, right now, front load their fiscal stimulus into these types of industries, um, we can then take a longer term view and support the capital growth and capital requirement needs in businesses that may then suffer as a result of government policy not particularly being as long term as we may want it to be. So if you were uh, the Chancellor and you were fashioning a set of post-COVID regulations to enable, assist, shore up, accelerate both the impact investing industry and certain critical impact investment sectors mm -hmm. what are the sorts of things 
you would be doing as a chancellor and ergo what are the sorts of things that we as citizens should be asking of our politicians to to regulate and to support in the aftermath of of COVID? Yeah so I'd definitely be looking at fiduciary duty um, and I'd be taking a very long hard look at fiduciary duty um, uh, with the SCA and understanding what that might uh, create in terms of hurdles and challenges for more capital inflow into sustainable and impact investing. There's a lot of work going on in that space at the moment. And Bates Wells have been doing a huge amount of work on fiduciary duty. Um, so I'd definitely be sitting, sitting here thinking, okay, how do I get more capital flowing? Where are the real barriers and challenges? And I think fiduciary duty for a long time has been a slight thorn in the side of sustainable and impact investing partly because there is a perception that you will sacrifice financial performance. Now, if we go right back to the beginning of you know, this conversation, Paul, we're now starting to see that that's not the case. So what else is potentially um, causing that kind of block? You know, we see it in the charity space hugely. Um, you know, trustees not willing to put charity capital into this type of investing because of the perceived risks associated with it. So fiduciary duty is one. I think business models um, is the second one. So what type of business model can be rolled out more broadly that really holds businesses to uh, manage the environmental, social and governance related risks within their business, not just from a management um, and policy point of view, but from a core product and service point of view. Um, there's a couple of things there you know, can mention. Um, the B Corps, the rise of the B Corps movement and mission driven businesses. I think you know, certainly that needs to factor into this conversation. I think the Companies Act as well, um, and looking at the Companies Act, and again, there's a huge amount of work now starting to happen in that space. Um, you know, how do we interrogate what a company's purpose is, and then how do we actually codify it and put that into statutes? Um, so there are some. I think there are some legal um, areas that the Chancellor can can certainly um, look at as well. Um, I think you know when you look at social investment, you look at some of the challenges around social investment. You know we we do have some some interesting um, tax incentives in the UK. We have social investment tax relief. We have community investment tax relief. I think I'd be looking at the taxation structures. A tax is a big issue, and we need to globally move to a much more fair and just tax system. But how can we also use tax? to really stimulate more capital coming into not just the public markets, you know, we've spoken a lot about public markets, you look at private markets, um, how can we stimulate more capital coming into the private marketplace to really support these mission driven businesses and charities also who were starting to move you know, more into that investment and trading space as well. So I think those three things I'd be looking at uh, fiduciary duty, I'd be looking at um, uh, the purpose of companies and company structure. Um, and um, then I, um, yeah, th th those three, I think. I, a colleague was recently telling me that there may be moves afoot to um, doubly incentivize startup investments through EIS um, uh, in the aftermath of COVID just to shore up the kind of startup early capital part of the um, of the kind of entrepreneurial continuum. Um, do you think that's a smart idea? You know, just saying for a year or 18 months or two years, there is an additional you know, um, tax benefit and additional capital gains relief to be got from EIS? Um, yes. <laughs> Depending, <laughs> depending on eligibility, um, you know, what, I, what I'd really want to see, and I'm assuming this is what your friend is referring to, what I'd really want to see is any form of um, CGT linked benefit is really anchored into the mission and the purpose of that business. Um, you know, definitely. Um, you know, we, as a general in entrepreneurship in the UK, you know, we do lag behind our American cousins in terms of the level of, of entrepreneurship. And especially when you then start to factor in things like gender equality, we're actually very similar to the US in that we don't have great gender equality in terms of the level of female entrepreneurs coming through. When you look at BAME, it's even, you know, it's an even bigger problem. Um, so 
I think we need to be thinking about the mission and the purpose of the businesses, but we also need to be thinking about where we stimulate entrepreneurship to come from as well and how we can make it easier for those communities to have their ideas supported as well. And there are some great third party um, businesses out there who do that, you know, uh, startup and, 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 and sort of um, private equity um, uh, finance houses that are very much focused on gender and very much focused on, on BAME and then sort of the, in the broadest sense, those who are socially excluded and or disenfranchised. So y yes, I do. I absolutely do. But I, I think, you know, we have to be really, really clear on the eligibility for that type of, um, that type of uh, preferential treatment. What I wouldn't want to necessarily see is that kind of treatment being made available to businesses that ultimately become part of the problem. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I want to talk about pension funds for a moment, because it seems to me that um, this is a gigantic pool of capital, which by definition has to look to the future and adopt a, a long-term framework and has to think about prevention and preparedness to things which I think COVID have really thrown into sharp relief. We recently held a session with uh, Richard Curtis, My Money Matter, which is trying to get ordinary pensioners to insist that their pensions are allocated more um, alongside their values and taking impact into account. Um, do you think that this might be a, a kind of profitable place to, to both seek long-term capital, but also maybe to do some of the kind of regulatory um, interventions which mandate that pension funds specifically take into account these long-term threats uh, when they allocate money to funds or investment managers um, uh, to kind of on behalf of the pensioners who they're looking out for? Yeah, so I mean, in the UK, we've already seen the pensions regulator move, you know, start to move into this space and we will see them, I think, continue to um, increase the level of scrutiny on, on pension providers. So, for example, looking at ESG disclosure on DB and, DB, um, DB and DC um, pension schemes above a thousand members. So we have seen some movement already. Um, and that's kind of, you know, um, volley one of what will hopefully be a much longer rally um, that will come. Um, yes, absolutely. I think when you consider the amount of capital that's held in pensions, if we can mobilize that as a force for real change, um, and a force for good, um, knowing that this isn't about sacrificing financial performance and putting pensioners' pensions at risk, then I think that's a phenomenal place for us to start. I also think we need to look at um, Scandinavia. There's some very, very interesting stuff going on in, um, unsurprisingly, the Scandi countries. Um, LD Pensions, which is a Danish pension provider, uh, recently um, submitted a tender to the open market through the EU for what they termed a future fit mandate and that's working with the uk charity the future fit foundation using the future fit benchmark which is this benchmark that's been developed with investors and investees now we're one of the investors so we sit on the development council with investors alongside people like hermes and web for example and then you've got investees so people like novo nordish um, body shop etc this benchmark is used to enable a, co um, a company to articulate um, effectively its purpose, its future strategy, and how future fit it is now versus how future fit it will become using the SDGs and baking the SDGs into that benchmark. So it's very, very unique. It's first of its kind. And then for investors, what that does is give us an opportunity to look at a company through, the, through a future lens rather than just a retrospective lens as well. And LD, it was a hundred and, um, if Martin Rich, who's the, um, one of the founders of um, Future Fit is listening, he's gonna shoot me now because I'll probably get the, the numbers wrong. But I think it was 160 million euro mandate um, that went out into the marketplace on public tender. Nordea, another Scandinavian finance house, actually got it. But we're starting to see in um, Scandinavia really interesting um, I think moves by the pension industry themselves into thinking about how do we embrace the SDGs into our investment paradigms? How do we then look at what it is that we need to do to become future fit and what, what others need to do to become future fit? So I think, you know, Richard's platform 
is coming at exactly the right time. You know, we could sit here, Paul, and say, oh gosh, it should have happened 10 years ago, it should have happened 20 years ago. You know, the universe knows perfect timing. Um, the time is right now. Um, so to equip pension holders to be able to do that, and there are some great um, assets out there. If you go on Client Earth's website, they've got a performer that you can download to uh, effectively hold your pension provider to account um, on issues to then actually working with the pension industry it, itself and giving them the opportunity to see what others are doing and where others are leading. Um, it's probably one of the biggest opportunities we have. I, I often refer to this, this uh, I think this, this space that we currently have it as being the, 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 the time just before we see what will become, I hope, the largest investment pilgrimage we have ever witnessed. Um, and that will be through to, to these future fit businesses that are really additive and creating the future that we all need. I have a question from one of our uh, participants who said, so far you, 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 the ESG and impact investing we've, we've been talking about is largely related to bigger businesses. What are your ideas around investing in true social enterprises, some of which may be smaller in nature? Yeah, so they become, you know, we as a, an organization, we're able to do those with our clients. It's very difficult if you're a retail investor to be able to access a lot of those opportunities. And I can understand why, um, absolutely. At the end of the day, you want to protect those who maybe don't have the, uh, the requisite skills. Um, and or experience um, to claim that they are you know, professional investors. I, I think there's a, there is an opportunity for us to look at private markets um, and the investment opportunities that are out there and understand what we can do to increase the level of capital that flows to smaller businesses that are mission driven. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity here for the government and not necessarily through big society capital who do a phenomenal job, but there is an opportunity and this has been bounded around for quite a while to create a sovereign fund, a UK sovereign fund um, that could be funded by multiple different channels. One is an increased tax on cor you know, corporate, so looking at corporation tax and tax avoidance there. Um, we need to increase the level of capital that is, is, is available for these businesses. Um, but we also need to, I think as well, um, increase the understanding in private markets as to what is a true mission-driven uh, business versus one that isn't. You know, we get approached on a, on a regular basis, as you can well imagine. I'm sure lots of people out there do, other wealth managers do as well. And sometimes, you know, we get approached by businesses that have kind of grabbed the SDGs and said, this is what we do, and this is why we do it. And actually there is a disconnect between, between the two. So, it's about equipping the front line as well, intermediaries, uh, wealth advisors, um, investment managers, etc., as to what does constitute a really impactful business and, and what doesn't. And again, you know, you're seeing uh, the likes of CFA rolling out training, albeit it's ESG training, but you're seeing a lot more focus now by the um, uh, those who are responsible for regulating the advisors who can then work with clients in helping them understand how to do this, where to do it, what's available, what's not available, and what constitutes impactful. But to answer the question, you know, it's, there is an issue with the level of capital available for these types of, of, of businesses. So whether there are opportunities for us to look at how can we democratize that more? Yes. How do we do it? Big question mark. Another question from Natasha Jamal, um, what will be the impact of low oil prices on sustainable energy investments? Well, I mean, again, big question. <laughs> oil prices uh, have been bouncy for a while. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. Um, my, I think in our sense with uh, clean and, and uh, affordable energy and what's happening in clean and affordable energy and the imperative for us to move to clean and affordable energy is that um, we will continue to see capital flowing into solar, into wind, you know, into hydrogen, for example, as one of the solutions, um, into all manner of new innovations coming through in the clean and affordable energy space. Um, that, I think, is an absolute given. I think what we may also see potentially coming through as well is low oil prices, the risk of stranded assets in oil and gas, um, we're going to hopefully <laughs> we're going to see 
um, more engagement by the oil and gas industry itself into this low carbon transition and a just transition um, as well. Now, we're not necessarily going to see it with some of the um, some of the well known uh, what I always refer to as problem children, the incumbents. Um, we'll wait and see what happens later this year. I think it's September, uh, September, October time when BP fill in the gaps as to how it's going to achieve its net zero. But the language coming out of BP now is very different. Now, I do say that with caution because I have known BP for 15 years. I used to sustain, I do sustainability consultancy with them when I was a management consultant. But certainly the mood music there seems to be different. So I think, you know, low oil prices, the increasing risk of um, stranded assets, you know, what is now fast unraveling as um, the climate crisis at a, at a pace that even the scientists couldn't have ever predicted. Um, my sense is you can't take oil prices out independently and say that's going to mean that this, you know, that this uh, will in, in, sorry, decrease the level of funding for clean tech and renewables. It's not as simple as that anymore. I'm going to ask a final question because we're, we're out of time, but we spent some time talking about what regulation can do to positively enable and encourage and incentivize the flow of capital towards companies which are seeking genuinely to positively impact people and the planet. We spent less time talking about what regulation can do to prohibit and punish um, and I wonder whether that's because we're being too timid as kind of people who care about this, you know, uh, the, the planet and a more just future. Um, and whether, you know, I, I, we had a conversation earlier about um, the mass use of antibiotics in factory farming. And if there was ever a moment to roll out a very robust regime which says you may no longer use antibiotics in factory farming with healthy animals because it is con contributing to drug resistant superbugs which are going to come and kill us in the same way that corona is. And if you were to do that, you would really transform factory farming because you wouldn't be able to have the proximity of animals to each other that you ordinarily do. And that would have a wildly beneficial set of impacts on climate in general. Um, and similarly with, you know, um, with, with oil and coal and coal-fired power plants, is this not a moment for us to start saying these need to be banned and shut down and prohibited because they, pay, they pose a real existential risk to us? So um, stop, stop trying to gently and kindly incentivize good behavior, but also start being more robust and pun punishing and prohibiting bad behavior. No, I totally agree. Um, I think you need the stick and the carrot. And I think, I don't, I don't know if it's us being too timid. I think it's probably us being too nice. And as you know, Paul, I'm not always particularly nice. I'm quite happy to call a spade a spade. <laughs> um, I think you need the stick and the carrot. And I think at the moment, um, you can look out globally, not just in the UK, you can look out globally to a, to a number of different um, countries and, and political responses. I don't think there's any one country there at the moment who has either put themselves out on a limb to be really, really supportive and or really, really um, uh, kind of punitive. I, 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 just, I just don't see it. I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity coming out and as we walk through this crisis politically um, for us to say, okay, what are the types of policies and regulations that we need to drive now the right consumer behavior, the right business behavior, the right political behavior. You know, what is it that we need to do? And so much of that is gonna come down to leadership um, and our definition of leaders and leadership, moving away from solitary to interdependent, I think is really, really key. I think our ability to understand our values and our belief systems as well. So um, I read a blog last week on, on fear. You know, we're all paralyzed by it. Politicians probably more than anyone else because of the popularity contest that seems to be, um, you know, out there at the moment. Um, so we, you know, we really need to get a much better handle on what is it that prevents us doing what it is that we know to be right? What? Um, and it will be a fear of some form. Um, so, you know, there needs to be a much more democratic conversation that happens. We need to get away from a lot of the combative politics that we've had, you know, 
you know, black and white, red and blue, you know, whatever, we need to move away from that and create an infrastructure, I think a political infrastructure, as well as a, a kind of a community infrastructure that is far less about the I and much more about the we. And then my sense is that we'll start to see people having the confidence um, and the support to be able to come out and say, well, we have to do this. And it might hurt, you know, there may be a period of hurt and pain that we have to go through to readjust, but readjust we must. Um, but that takes courage. It takes real courage and real conviction. And I think, well, I hope this current crisis that we are in, I think, you know, Anna, um, Aaron Darty Roy wrote, in, obviously in the F FT, it's a portal. It's more than a portal, it's a mirror. It's holding a mirror up to ourselves and it's showing us for who we truly are. And we have an opportunity now to sit back and say, I see myself, I see my community, I see my business, I see my government. What do I like and what don't I like? And then how do, I, how do we work together to improve it? Amy, that is a beautiful um, you know, point in which to, to wrap up. Um, we're over time, but because it was time well spent. So thank you very, very much for your um, commitment and for your insights. And um, I look forward to having a cocktail with you on the sixth floor when we, when we open up. And thank you everybody for, for listening in. Um, uh, so stay safe and stay well and uh, see you tomorrow. No, not tomorrow. It's Friday. Um, <laughs> we'll see you next week. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Thanks, Paul. Bye.